You're listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Here are your hosts, Fran Chismar and Tom Knezic. Welcome to the Insider Tip Edition of The Buzz, brought to you by Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. I am Fran Chismar. And I'm Tom Knezic, and welcome to a new year and episode 35. Man, it, it <laughs> surprises me all the time. It, it really does. <laughs> yeah, and we, we guys have a lot in store for you this year, but we want to kick it off with a buzz. Kind of, I guess, give uh, not really a state of the union, but a quick update on our, our new year plans. Yeah, I think so. First of all, before we do that, how were your holidays? They were good. It's uh, it's amazing how much they changed just having, like, a little kid around. Um, yeah. Even if he's six months old or six and a half. But, um, yeah, it was just, we went, we didn't really go anywhere. We woke up early and opened some presents at our house and then went to my parents' house, which is a couple hundred yards away, opened some presents there, went to Melissa's parents' house, my wife's parents' house, and... Um, open some presents there uh, a lot for him a lot for him to load in the car and I, get home yeah but uh so it was all in a 15 minute radius and didn't have like the big family get together so yeah. we're used to but I, that's I re- what we got to do i remember when the boys were young it becomes difficult at some point because we were opening presents at home going to my parents house and opening presents mm-hmm. going to their mother's house and opening presents or their their mother's parents house yeah. their grandparents opening presents and they just kind of wanted to be home and playing with what they yeah. opened yeah. with. <laughs> so it was a long day. Like, yeah. it was oh, overwhelming. Yeah. I, I remember and, we got to my, my in-law's house, and I sat down on the couch, and my eyes were kind of closing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's really cool. Huh? <laughs> if, if, if you knew how many pictures there were either at my parents' or my, my former in-law's house, like half asleep, you know, it's <laughs> mm-hmm. you know it's just because you're, you're – um, getting up early and getting stuff stuff ready yeah. or you're staying up late getting stuff ready and it's just it's a long yeah. day but even, like even my brother he was like it was just so much more fun this year just to have someone little and get to see the excitement even though he didn't really know that yeah. what christmas was or what was going on but just he, he got a gift and he loved the wrapping paper and we kind of <laughs> scratch at it until some of it started to fall off and uh, yeah you know it I, was a lot of fun some of the early years i remember like the kids opening the first thing and that's all they they didn't care like that was it yeah. like like the, i think the first couple christmases they didn't open everything the first day mm-hmm. you know it was just too overwhelming so it's yeah i get it they're good times though man enjoy it it's oh yeah it's, uh, yeah it was a lot of fun awesome so. awesome yeah mine were mine were good pretty you know relatively uneventful you know mm-hmm. it was it just like a really nice holiday with with family uh you know there's uh agatha's family always does a christmas eve uh, mm-hmm. um uh, meal we did that and and uh yeah it was it was like a, a week long of of rest and relaxation so i'll I'll take that yeah i'll oh, take yeah. that so i guess we should go do a little bit of state of yeah so what i kind of touched on is uh and we've been talking about for a while is we want to start having these roundtable discussions which i'd like to find a new name for but we haven't figured that out yet <laughs> something a little more catchy i haven't even thought about that but um but our first one is actually going to be next week. Yes. And it's yes. we have a really uh, nice panel, I guess, is the one way to put it. Yeah. Another not-so-sexy way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we have a, a nice group of a lot of our friends yes. who yes. are doing something similar to us. And it's we want to really kind of pull back the curtain on the business side of native plants. Yeah. And... Um, uh, so we found some of our friends that were growers with, or some other growers that we're friends with, and they're gonna we're gonna figure out how to have like a little web meeting and record it and yeah. and share that all with you guys about well how do we figure out what we're gonna grow and yeah and those kind of things those kind of questions and these are conversations we have mm-hmm. that the general public doesn't they're not privy to or they don't get to see yeah so it's really getting like a secret glimpse of kind of like our our everyday yeah. like if we see someone at a conference or at a trade show or may even just give them a call mm-hmm. and 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 toss something by it yeah because a lot of times there's people who want certain things and they might have an attachment to them but 
coming from a grower's perspective, it can't just be one person who wants it. It's got to be a lot of times thousands of people who want it or a couple of people who want thousands. And, um, and that's what we're going to talk about, that yeah. kind of stuff, how we get into marketing, how we yeah. uh, just make a lot of these decisions and why what you might see at your local garden center or see uh, available to you, how that comes comes to pass. Yeah, you know, and those are those are some things I'd love to talk about with the group mm-hmm. of people we have. Like one of the things that we mention a lot, and and I don't want to go into too, too much. Mm-hmm. I, I really something that I'm curious talking to the other people, um, the other nurseries. You know, the hard thing is when when because we don't deal with the general public in communicating with the general public. Even though what we do, we do for for all the right reasons and purposes Mm -hmm. we're still a business and we still have to Mm -hmm. make money a lot of our employees depend on Mm -hmm. on how well we do so it's it's still i I think people don't associate what we do as being a business yeah and that makes it difficult sometimes because you still have to make business decisions yeah and it was uh (laughs) i don't want to get too off topic yeah but (laughs) one of my favorite uh favorite stories from when i was in grad school was uh, we went and saw a bunch of um, wetland restorations and went on a tour. And we got to the very end, and uh, someone asked our tour guide, he's like, man, what inspired you to do all this? And he's like, well, I got paid to do all of this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's like, it was the money behind it. That's why I did all this. And it was like hundreds of acres of wetland restorations yeah. that we just saw. And the the main – obviously, that wasn't his, his yeah. real motivator, but – and he enjoyed doing the work, but he was able to make a living doing it, do it, and, and have the lifestyle he wanted, doing some great work. But that he loves, yeah. He couldn't just do it if he wasn't getting paid for it. So. And and that's what I was going to say. And when we never speak poorly of anyone. We'd rather promote the things that we do well rather than talk badly mm-hmm. about what someone else doesn't do well. But you know, we we're fortunate enough that we get to do this for a living Mm -hmm. that we do the right things and we're fortunate enough to make a living some people do it because they're business people and that's the niche that they found where they can make money um and i'll say the folks that we have coming on are all people who they're like minded they they live the lifestyle and they're they're living their dream basically yes yes they're doing something they love and um and really believe in and that's why we're all good friends because we're all in it for the same reasons so, so and that's something i'm really looking forward to and you guys will get to hear next week uh, but we also have some authors lined up some really cool guests uh our we've said a probably a hundred times our main uh our starting point was to have on a lot of these non-government organizations that we work with that were doing some really great work and uh that list just continues to grow of people we have to have on but we want to branch out a little bit more yeah. and um like I said, have some of these roundtables, have some of these other discussions that are pertinent to the overall uh, conversation. So. We we probably have enough episodes lined up with the buzz and the roundtables mm-hmm. and the things probably to get us through the spring. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, and we yeah. got we're always going to have the buzz kind of as that in between to really keep that conversation going, to keep it light, and um, um and to to expand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So um. And besides that, uh, I want to make sure we we say thank you. We did receive some more five star reviews, mm-hmm. uh, which we love. Thank you, uh, Blazing Star, and Always Wandering uh, NJ for uh, the wonderful reviews on Apple Podcasts. Mm-hmm. We really appreciate it. And all of your listens um, really made a difference. We're consistently top twenty nature yeah. podcast in yeah. in the U.S. and 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 kind of Canada now. Mm-hmm. We did find out we were the number one nature podcast in Iraq. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Which I don't know where that came from. But. And the number two science mm-hmm. podcast in Iraq. Mm-hmm. So I don't think it was a lot of listens no, to I, get us there. No, I doubt it. But well, I, th- I thought that was really interesting. But no, it's, it's all wonderful stuff. The the uh, Facebook group conversation has been great, and the amount of uh, members is really mm-hmm. – like every time I look, it's like 20 new members it's, every week. It's really flattering, and it's – I'm always surprised when I go into like you go into the category section of of uh, in Apple Podcasts and then you scroll down and you find eventually can get to nature yeah and um, that we're on that list we're not at the top of the list but we're in the middle we're but, we're, but the, we're on the list I never thought we'd get there no and it's less than a year yeah you know and it's yeah. every month that you know it changes for us so, so let hopefully we can keep yeah. that trend but that's going. all thanks to you guys uh, just yeah. keep listening and and keep make, sharing make sure keep, we're we're 
providing content you want to listen to. Let us know what you want to hear because we want to provide that and keep sharing it. We want to get this message even further off the ground. Yeah, we 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 say it all the time, but we need to make that circle bigger. So that's a big thing. So, all right, you ready? I'm ready. That's hot. Would you like to go first, or would you? I'll, like? I'll go first. All right. Mine's got a little bit of a story, but uh, for those of you who might be new, because I know we got a quite a few new listeners just over the last couple yeah. of weeks. Uh, and maybe you haven't listened to an episode of The Buzz yet, but That's Hot is where we kind of talk about, or I shouldn't say kind of talk about, we do talk we about do. the things that, or plants we're seeing that kind of inspire us in some way. And uh, the winter gets really hard. <laughs> There's not, <laughs> we, I think we started this in like October or we, something. We, <laughs> we're like, oh yeah, we, we can we, keep this going. Yeah, yeah, you know, it was easy when, when it started. There were There were plenty of choices, mm-hmm. but... You know, the funny thing is the last couple buzzes, I was like, I'm really going to have to look hard for something. Mm -hmm. And the day before, something naturally just falls in my lap, which makes it fun. And mine was really more of an alternative use for a plant. And um, cool. And it ties back into the podcast. So our last episode was with Ed Farley from Ducks Unlimited. Mm -hmm. And and I mentioned on there, I I used to duck hunt really when I was a kid. I was a teenager. And uh, and would go. It was kind of a social thing with my dad, my brother, one of my dad's friends, and um, and we'd go to this uh, marsh down in southern New Jersey, and it was just kind of social. I was younger, so I felt like oh, I'm one of the guys here. This is kind of cool. And uh, as I got older and and went into college, and I didn't have as many opportunities, I kind of got out of it. And always thought, oh, this would be fun to get back into, but never had the, had the opportunities. Well, after last week's podcast. I went out and bought my duck stamp. So there's twenty five dollars oh, going nice. to well, twenty four fifty that are going to <laughs> habitat conservation. Ninety eight percent of that goes directly towards habitat conservation. Yeah. And uh and then I talked to my brother and a couple of my friends who do duck hunt and we ended up going out uh just a couple of days ago. Oh and, awesome. And uh so my that's hot plant is deer tongue. because oh, we went into nice. a wet meadow and uh, I actually like to walk around in this wet meadow mm-hmm. other times of the year and I know it's full of deer tongue, which is it used to be panicum clandestinum. Yeah. Now it's, it's like the. De- <laughs> I can't I remember the names on it. Yeah, you know, I can't remember what the new name. It I, starts I with still, a I still refer to it as panicum. <laughs> oh, and I think a lot of people do. And it's uh just a, a like a marsh. Um, I'm pretty sure it's technically grass too. Yeah. Um, so a marsh grass that uh, grows in wet areas. It's a fact wet, and uh, but. For our purposes, we help use that to camouflage in our our blind that we hunted out of. Oh, nice! And Very nice. Yeah, we were successful. We got some a couple of geese and a, a handful of ducks, and then I took them home and made some really really good meals out of them. That's actually oh, one awesome. of the things I really love about hunting is it combines a bunch of my favorite things, being nature, uh, cooking, and history. So very I cool. Made like tea smoked duck breast, which was really good. Ooh, and I made a duck breast sense. ragu where I braised it all day with some onions and carrots and oh, that other cool good. stuff made it put I, one time we used it on risotto the next time we made some pasta and you know, it was really good that i have some leftover. i should bring it in now i'm hungry so. <laughs> <laughs> you so. know the one thing I, I was i was actually just thinking the other day you having a kid kind of ruined something for me because before you had a kid you were making more food and bringing it into the office that to is share. True, yeah. <laughs> like there was always jerky or sausage yeah. or, or something. We haven't gotten a lot of yeah. food well, between that and the pandemic. I haven't I haven't been making as much. But the thing is, uh, is Graham, my son, loves yeah. our cooking. Both my wife's and my cooking because yeah. we give him like a little taste of everything, and he liked the duck. He's had uh, deer meat. He's had oh, very all cool. kinds of stuff. So we yeah. like we he, like duck and deer meat here too. Yeah. <laughs> he likes it. He likes it better than than a lot of the Gerber baby foods and other things that we make for him. So very cool. But very Fran, cool. what what was your your plan? So mine was, and again, it's uh, coming into work. Um, a, uh, was it? It might have been yesterday. I think it was mm-hmm. yesterday. And uh, in front of the office, we have a garden, and I noticed something flowering, which kind of caught me off guard. Yeah. You know, for January, and as I got up, I realized that the golden Alexanders in our garden were blooming, um, and not just like sporadically; like it was actually putting mm-hmm. out a few bloom shoots. So I thought that was really interesting, and that's not normal. Um, no, but that's been a plant that's really kind of perplexed me too, because in our our seed propagation field, 
it started blooming, I think, like, in, it might have been in April. It was in May, yeah. for sure. And I was like, oh, I guess this blooms earlier. And then, but then it was blooming again in June and July. And all, it was, like, blooming yeah, all year. It, it, it was just new blooms kept kept coming up. And I don't know if that's typical of the plant. Yeah, it's, I, it was a new plant for us. It, yeah, so, so I know typically it's supposed to be a May-June bloom. But, mm-hmm. like, a lot of things, and we're going to go into this when we talk about our insider tips, yeah. that... Some things, when you you trim back after they bloom, you'll get an, an, another uh, session of blooming mm-hmm. from it. So, I just thought that was really interesting because we hadn't cleaned up the garden. Yeah, and it just yeah. kind of but there was nothing to stimulate it, and we've had snow. You mm-hmm. know, it, I just thought it was really interesting that was blooming. But it's a, a facultative species in the carrot family. Um, not typical to bloom this time of the year, but was blooming. Mm-hmm. So I just thought that was pretty and interesting. And I, I know, and that the one out there, it's been blooming all yeah, year too. Yeah, Every time, oh, it's blooming again. But uh, I know Kelly Gill really likes that plant for the pollinator value. Yeah, um, and it's in quite a few seed mixes that we spec out, and and other folks spec out as well. Yeah. So awesome, awesome. So I thought the 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 topic for for this episode of the buzz we we thought the we do insider tips and i was kind mm-hmm. of inspired by the end of the last buzz when we did the pod decks to give yeah. a money saving yep. tip and i was like you know what you know and it, we we both had to think of something on the spur of the moment and i i feel that i was really excited about the advice that we gave her the tips that we gave i'm mm-hmm. like we should do a little bit more of that yeah. like so mm-hmm. tom and i each came up with at least three. I think Tom has more than three. I, I just three. kept adding to my list. <laughs> I was like, ah, I should talk about this too. Mine, I didn't feel like were the best insider tips. I feel like they might be a little lackluster. So I'm making up with quantity versus the quality. I don't of my know tips. that mine are that great either. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, it's it's just something small. Not that it's yeah, going to be a, a life changing tip, but if you're working on one of these things, it may help that's you. That's some great promotion for our tips. You really yeah. need to listen to these because they are <laughs> lackluster at best. <laughs> it's almost as good as, hey, here's a great documentary. I don't know what it's called. I don't know who's in it. <laughs> That's a recipe for great podcasting. Oh, yeah. There you go. All right. So would you like to go first? You want me to go I'll first? Let you go first. Okay. So my first one, uh, I was rereading um, Bringing Nature Home. I've been going back. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I've been rereading Origin of Species by – by Darwin, also. I think you mean the invasion of species. Oh, the inv- yes. sorry, yes, the inv- <laughs> <laughs> the invasion of species, <laughs> and that's a, a callback uh, joke from many from, episodes of- <laughs> from Saul. <laughs> but um, and one of the things that that Dr. Tallamy talks about is there's three categories of mm-hmm. oaks throughout the U.S. In the Northeast, we have uh, white oak and red oak, mm-hmm. and he had mentioned that um, in the fall. The white oak, white oak category, their acorns will actually germinate just a few days after they drop. Mm-hmm. So it's easy to tell what a viable acorn is because it will it will start rooting. But the red oak uh, category does not do that. So wait, say that again. The white oak the one or germi- red oak? The no. white oak germinates. The, the white fall. oak germinates in the fall. The white oak okay. germinates in the fall when they when they drop. Mm-hmm. But the red oak germinate in the spring. Gotcha. So it's easy to tell. The white oak, because they're germinating shortly after, like you can gather ones that you know are germinating. Mm-hmm. So how do you know with red oak if you're waiting till spring? Like if you're collecting them in the fall, how do you know? Like are, how do you know if you're you're picking viable acorns? It's, it's obvious on the white oak, but not on the red oak. Mm-hmm. So uh, one thing that you can do, um, and it's actually something our propagation department does, uh, when you're collecting uh, – acorns from the red oak category you can submerge them in water or or drop them Mm -hmm. in water and the viable seeds will actually drop to the bottom of the water and the the acorns that aren't good float at the top so they're not as heavy they're not as dense and they just kind of float so you know you can skim those off and 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 toss them out and the ones that sink to the bottom uh have a better chance of germination so i thought that would be a good tip of, of just knowing what you know what may germinate from what you've collected mm-hmm. for that? Yeah, and I know we we use that on on Quercus rubra, yeah. northern red oak yeah. specifically. Yeah, and I would I would think probably a lot of the red oak classifications you can do that with. Yeah, I would think so. I would it's, think yeah, so. It's interesting. So I just thought that would be a nice tip if you're if you're looking to collect your own uh, oak seed and and you're just looking to you know so you kind of have an idea of how you're going to make out that's a mm-hmm. that's a good way to to check yeah very cool so uh one of mine 
and I reorganized because our tip number three is actually very <laughs> similar. So yeah, now right. you're only getting a <laughs> yeah. one, one less tip. We can combine but, uh, those. How about that? We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that one together. But um, my first tip was to use uh, the BoneApp website, or the Taxonomic da- Data Center in particular, which I've talked about on the podcast before, but it's something I use all the time because it really boils down the nativity of plants. Um, it's a resource that just about anyone can use, and if you're in just all, in any discussion group about native plants, there's always the questions like, oh, I found this plant. I want to know where it's native to. Well, that's a great – Yeah. just go online and, and look it up. And that kind of ties into one of my other tips yeah. later on too. So. No, that's a great tip. What, I, what's your number two, friend? So my number two, um, you know, again, inspired by bringing nature home, um, one of the things that Dr. Tallamy talks about is – elm hybridizing so elms were actually a pretty dominant species early on and then dutch elms disease came through and and naturally it's not a dominant tree anymore but after years of hybridizing there's uh i think it's like uh valley forge and liberty and frontier there's there's a bunch of uh american elms that are are being hybridized to be resistant to dutch elms disease so the one that stands out to me and and the reason why i know this is because i worked for the nursery that introduced it so the princeton elm which was introduced by uh princeton nurseries um it was actually selected it wasn't hybridized it was selected out of a seedling field by william flemmer based on its form because it exhibited even as a seedling that classic face shape form it just happened you know and that was in 1922 it just happened to be naturally resistant to Dutch Elms disease. Mm. So if you're really looking at adding Elm, if, if you're, you know, if, if Elm's something you want to add to your native mix, I would go more towards a Princeton Elm than the other ones. So instead of something hybridized, this selection is just a natural, you know, unhybridized American Elm that exhibits great classic shape if you're if you're anywhere new princeton new, uh new jersey i think it's washington avenue the the elm lined mm-hmm. um street going into the princeton is is princeton elm so um it's a it's a good selection if you want to go that form to bring it back into the mix that's the way to go yeah so this is just another note yeah. i had that I had as like number six on my list, but I'm actually going to use it, <laughs> use it now as not a tip. But yeah. do you know of any other resources out there to help find where cultivars came from? It's really difficult. You know, some are easy. The newer ones are easy because it will go back to um, who introduced them or who did the hybridization. Mm-hmm. You know, like if you look at things like Blue Holly, um, you know, you can see Kathleen Reserve introduce them by mixing mm. english holly with um i'm trying to remember the other holly she mixed with it to to try to get a different breed something a little more hardier because english holly weren't as winter hardy you know and those types of things are easy to come by not all of them it's really mm. difficult it's 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 actually pretty 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 hard yeah i guess where my point would be with that is uh and you mentioned it with the the princeton elm is it was a selection not a hybrid hybridization yeah. and um and that's <clears throat> cultivars in the native space kind of get a bad rap sometimes. And uh, like I'm, I'm, and I'm not a cultivar guy by any means. I, I'm not either. But they do have a place, especially when it comes to attracting new native plant gardeners. Um, and it's if you really wanted to cultivar, because it is a known, uh, mm-hmm. a known thing. What you're going to yeah. get is you know exactly what it's going to look like from planting it. But a lot, I shouldn't say a lot, but there are cultivars out there of native plants that are selections yes. and not hybridizations because selections can be grown from seed and a lot of or i shouldn't say a lot of not them, all again. of them some of them yeah. but uh but when it comes to the cultivars you'll see a lot of times people say oh don't use cultivars at all they're hybrids they're they're aliens to the space and that's not always the case and like i said i'm some, not a cultivar guy but because some are clones yeah some are being uh propagated through tissue culture or divisions mm-hmm. things like that um you know and some are are natural selection so it's i i have a feeling that this is going to be the topic for the next buzz yeah Um, (laughs) Yeah. because it's you know what it's a some people are very passionate about Mm -hmm. this and 
I'm not going to advocate for – you know, I have my own opinion, yes. and I'll yeah. state that it's my opinion. I'm not going to state that it's fact. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a preference. Yeah. And we could spend a whole episode on yeah. this, I think. Oh, yeah. I guess I wasn't sure if there was something out there for people to look at where the cultivar came from to see. Was it a selection? Was it a hybridization? Where was the selection from? Because in like I, the greater point I'm trying to get at is some of these cultivars are okay. They're natural selections, probably or sometimes from a place that was yeah. close to where you live. Um, sometimes um, it was far away from where you live, but it may fit those criteria and give you a known product. Uh, some, in some cases, some of it's lost. You know, yeah. like I said, some of the newer stuff um, is better documented. Because mm-hmm. I've read in two books that both said Princeton Elm was hybridized. Mm-hmm. I know that it's not only because I worked for the nursery yeah. that introduced it. That nursery went out of business, no longer has a website. That mm-hmm. information is down to whoever possesses the knowledge. You can't yeah. find it yeah. online. So it's, you know, a lot of. Uh, you know, William Flemmer, a lot of things like Alex Glaber Densa, he found in the Pine Barrens, mm-hmm. you know, and it's a selection just because he felt that for a native inkberry, it was a little more full. Mm-hmm. Um, and, it, it, you know, and we know it originated from uh, the Pine Barrens. So did I'm trying to remember the Ilex Opaca that he introduced. But, mm-hmm. you know, like at one point that was all on their website. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. no website anymore. It's just kind of lost. So mm-hmm. it's, I, I think anything newer is going to be easier yeah. and anything going back to that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's funny that it's not that long. It's less, less than a hundred years. We're going to have to do a whole episode of that. So I'm going <laughs> to stop talking about cult wars. Yeah. Since it's not Sorry. even really a tip. It was just a note yeah. on, on this list. <laughs> but my second insider tip was really to, if you're looking into uh, kind of jumping a year, and I think this is even something I've brought up before too, is uh, look into fall seeding and fall planting. It's yeah. not great for everything, but um, with, when it comes to planting, but a lot of times you can get a jump because if you plant it in September or even October, uh, mid-October, depending on where you live, yeah, uh, you can get some root growth and just the plants will take hold a little bit whether it's from seed or or a plant uh just a little bit in the fall if it's seed you'll get that overwinter um stratification the yeah. cold moist stratification that comes from naturally from a winter from the frost and snow and, and ice and that kind of stuff and then that next year you'll get from seed better germination from plants you'll have a little bit more growth sometimes um i've really enjoyed doing it personally in my gardens uh, I have the luxury of picking through some of the stuff we have left over in the nursery. Yeah. And uh, instead of taking it in the spring when it's new and fresh and we can sell it. But that first year of my garden, the first spring of my garden, first summer of my garden, you get a lot more flowers, a lot more growth when you do it that way versus um, doing it in the spring. And you can, if you're going to garden centers, you're probably paying a, paying a little less for those plants too. You, you know, here's for, for planting – when you're planting in the spring, you can go from a, a perfect spring to a, a, a dry summer, mm-hmm. and and which is stressful on the plant. But when you're planting in the fall, it's getting ready for dormancy or is dormant. You're not worried about watering. It's it's less intensive. You know, keeping it. You know, it's from a watering standpoint. Um, but not only that, if you think about how nurseries overwinter plants, mm-hmm. you know, because you want them to go dormant naturally and you want them to break dormant dormancy naturally um so a lot of the times they're just in cold frame greenhouses with maybe a frost blanket that gets pulled when it gets Mm. too cold so technically the warmth of the ground is better insulation than having them above ground on rock with plastic over it so Mm. and then when if it's a early spring like which may be too wet for you to naturally get out there it's already in the ground it's ready to to break dormancy Mm. and you're getting a jump start Mm -hmm. exactly i think that's a great that's a, that's a great tip. Yeah. That's a great tip. I didn't think about that one. <laughs> um, I just want to preface – before I say the next one, I was thinking about this. And I'm like somewhere in, in what I've said, I'm sure I've said something incorrect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I always say it, I'm not an expert. I'm sure that I've said something incorrect, and if I haven't, I'm going to yeah. on numerous occasions. So please note, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on this. So mm-hmm. – 
there there may be something that I, I may have said incorrectly or I may just have the information off. If you know mm-hmm. something different, please let yeah. us know. Oh, or... I, I got somewhat called out in our <laughs> Facebook group, uh, uh, I think it was last week. Um, someone said, oh, yeah, you said something. I don't even remember exactly what it was. But I said something, and really I think I just misspoke. Yeah. Um, because I was like, oh, that's not that's not true at all. I really hope I, I think I commented. I'm like, I hope I didn't say that because that's yeah. not true. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like I'm not a scientist, yeah. and even with with science, you know, I, I was trying to, and, and this was a conversation I was having with with Skip in our, mm-hmm. our Facebook group, and 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 maybe I presented it incorrectly. Like to me, sometimes whatever is being presented science wise doesn't show the whole picture one of our listeners uh shared an article with me about common reed grass or phragmites Mm -hmm. of the benefits that it does as far as soil erosion and nutrients and things like that and they were saying we shouldn't spend as much money eradicating it to plant natives even though Mm -hmm. it chokes them out when it's doing a good job but it doesn't mention that it breaks the food web, mm-hmm. that it only hosts three Lepidoptera as compared to the numerous that <laughs> that, yeah. that are native marshes gra- uh, marsh grasses uh, promote. So it's – you know, it's only presenting part of mm-hmm. – you know, and depending on what you're trying to – and I shouldn't – maybe I shouldn't say agenda. Depending on what you're trying to reinforce, you yeah, can reinforce find something – Yeah, reinforce or promote. You can find something You can find something up. that backs it up, and that's what I was saying. Like sometimes mm-hmm. I feel that some of the science is ir- irresponsible because it's mm-hmm. not giving the whole picture. Like oh, yeah. th- that article in the wrong hands you know, of, of someone that was willing to spend the money to, to uh, remediate an area – not remediate, but uh, – to, to fix an area that mm-hmm. maybe is ravaged, like the Meadowlands, had yep. they decided not to turn that into uh, salt marsh in a lot of these projects, that'd be horrible. That would mm-hmm. be a, a true loss. Mm-hmm. So it's, um, but anyway, there's there's lots of different opinions. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just presenting what I feel. I don't know why I'm giving this disclaimer. <laughs> I just had this really I horrible <laughs> feeling that I'm saying something wrong. <laughs> that's I think that's why. But uh, so, all right, my third tip, and I found this out by accident back, ooh, probably 30 years ago. So um, Asclepius tuberosa or uh, butterfly weed, uh, butterfly milkweed, after it blooms, I, I had one year where it was being ravaged, completely ravaged by aphids, and I cut it back right after it finished blooming while well, the plant sprung back up and put up a whole nother set of blooms. Mm-hmm. So you can take – it, not everything can do this, but there are certain plants that you can cut back maybe a portion. Of, if you have like three, you can cut back one and provide habitat or blooms or nectar throughout. Mm-hmm. You can extend its season yeah. into the fall. So instead of it just being done in the summer, you know, you can help out by having some of it. You can stagger those mm-hmm. those bloom cycles yeah, to, another to help cool out. One. Yeah. Mine is – uh, also talks about cutting it back here, cutting okay. things back. Okay. And this is actually a tip I learned from Pat Sutton, who's a, 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 I guess a native plant kind of environmental speaker in Southern New Jersey. But one of the things she advocates, and I think it's on her email newsletter is on Memorial day and the 4th of July to give your plants a haircut. Yeah. Uh, and not everything. If you have stuff that's blooming or it's about to bloom, it has buds. You don't want to cut it back yeah. then. But things like golden rods, your asters, things that bloom later in the year, especially. Uh, and I did this this year and had a lot of success. I cut them back a couple of days after Memorial Day, um, and uh, just just snipped them about maybe a foot and a half to two feet high. Okay. And then around July Fourth, I went back and did it maybe at two feet high or a little bit taller than the first time, and. The plants came back lower, more full, way more flowers. It was really cool. Uh, the year prior, our garden mm-hmm. kind of got a little out of control. It was really tall. We have some tall stuff in there. Yeah. Echinacea gets some taller. Uh, Heliopsis will get taller. Uh, even Monarda fistulosa. I had Monarda fistulosa that was almost six feet tall, wow. <laughs> which was a little bit unruly. And because it was so tall and leggy, even though it had lots of flowers, it just looked like a wall of green and yeah. not the untrained eye would say it looked really weedy yeah uh and where i looked at it and saw oh wow they look at all the value that we have for pollinators and insects and birds and all that kind of stuff 
Um, from curb appeal uh, approach, it wasn't a great look. Yeah. But um, this past year, after I trimmed back, and I trimmed back all those same species, I trimmed back the, the goldenrods we had, the ashes we had, and eupatoriums, every, basically everything in the garden outside of the penstem and baptisia that were blooming, I trimmed it back. Yeah. And um, and then the Minarda started to bloom come end of June and July, and they were only like two and a half feet tall, and it was almost like a mat across the top of all blooms. And uh, then come July 4th, I didn't trim back the Heliopsis okay. and the Echinacea yeah. and the Minarda because they were blooming, yeah. but I still trimmed the Asters and, and the uh, the Goldenrods. Okay. And same thing when they came to bloom, they were just maybe three feet tall and just a carpet of blooms on top versus being six feet tall and a little leggy and uh and still having lots of blooms yeah. but not nearly as many it was it was nerve-wracking because <laughs> yeah. i was like i hope i'm not screwing up and killing all these plants but it worked no that's a great tip actually you know and and for our listeners that may not realize it like sometimes you may look at a plant and go oh it says naturally it only gets three to four feet tall but it's getting five to six feet tall at my my property why mm-hmm. is that it, you know, did do I have a variety? And I don't know. A, a lot of it is is habitat. If you take a a plant that is full sun plant and mm-hmm. you put it in partial shade, sometimes that plant will stretch to to get it. It's it's not as full. It's a little more leggy and it stretches to to get to that sunlight. So, yeah. you know, a little bit of sh- you know shearing or pruning helps. I do it with my cut leaf coneflower, uh, Rudbeckia luciniata, just because that plant on its own gets so tall mm-hmm. that it flops but if you yep. give it a haircut once or twice early on you get a much shorter compact plant with more blooms yeah. and so. when i was cleaning up the garden uh, a couple weeks or months ago um i was cutting some stuff back mm-hmm. just to cut the yeah i leave a lot of stem but yeah i cut it back to like a foot foot and a half and uh and where i'd made those cuts in was earlier in the spring you could see where I made the cut, and then just below it, like four branches would come out, yeah. and on one of the golden rods, I'm thinking in particular. And then where I made the next cut, it was the cuts, and then four more branches <laughs> would come out. It was pretty cool just to see. But going back to what you were just yeah. saying, Fran, sometimes it's just the uh, phenotypical differences. Yeah. So with that genotype, with the genetics of that plant, how it acts once you put it in different conditions. Yeah. I know I heard a story about Panicum virgatum Dallas Blues. I think I'm forgetting what exact cultivar it was. It was a cultivar of Panicum virgatum, where it was known to not grow as tall and stay upright. Yeah, that was its its trademark. Was it stayed vertical? It didn't flop yeah. over, but it was from Texas. That's why I think it was Dallas yeah. Blues. It was originally a selection from Texas. They started planting in the Northeast, and it grew six feet tall and flopped over <laughs> <laughs> by the middle of summer because it wasn't where it was growing in Texas. It didn't get yeah. nearly as much rain. It yeah. was much more arid and then you brought it to the northeast where it was getting way more water and it grew like the panicums we had here that's a whole yeah i was gonna say let's save that for cultivars (laughs) because that that leads into we're we're gonna say now the next buzz is going to be about (laughs) cultivars so that that will or maybe some will will at least designate a portion of it to talking about cultivars so So. i had two more quick notes go for it that are somewhat tips there was, one of them might even be a gripe, less of a tip. <laughs> um, but the first one was uh, looking at your P- when you're having issues with plants, look at the pH and look at the EC if you have the, the cap- capability to do it. pH isn't that hard to figure out. EC is a lot more complicated. Yeah. But um, what I found at the nursery this spring is we were actually looking at an alternative media, which was a recycled newspaper, and it had a different pH than, uh, than our normal – potting media and after about a couple probably two weeks the plants were side by side the plants in this alternative media were way shorter uh and just almost looked bleached out in some cases and um we didn't do the math or i shouldn't say we i didn't do the math right (laughs) when we mixed that up and the ph was way off and um and when i went on google and looked up the the symptoms of the plant that's when I found out, oh, it's iron deficient, or it could be iron deficient. That's kind of what looks like these symptoms. Iron deficiency was a sign of the pH being too high. I tested the pH. It was over 7 when it should have been around 6.2. We used actually a pH remedy, got the pH where it was supposed to be. The plants took off. And it was 
that's that's a real insider tip. Yeah, I mean that's a you know I and I think if I can add to that, if you don't mind, mm-hmm. you know, because we learned a lot from that experiment yeah. for a few reasons. There's no such thing as one size fits all Mm -hmm. Um, because the other thing we learned was there were a lot of trials and experiments going with that medium and in one of the experiments it it was almost there was like a mold uh, starting Mm -hmm. well it because it had different water capacities we realized Mm -hmm. we didn't need to water that mix as much as our normal mix it Mm -hmm. actually cut down on on water consumption and once Mm -hmm. we got the watering right you know it's you have to find what's works good for your system and what part of your systems you need to adjust to get the best results so it was really a a big learning experience like and a good experience it's like oh if we lo- use this we mm-hmm. can cut our watering down it's yeah. it's a good thing and we're producing good plants you know so it's um you know and the other thing too that made me think of when you brought this up if if you're going to do a large amount of planting it's it's been said on multiple episodes of the podcast. It all starts with the soil. Get a soil mm-hmm. test if you yeah. really want a pro tip. Before you plant, get a soil test. See what you're working with, and see if anything needs to be fixed mm-hmm. before, or just what the right plants yeah, are. If your pH is a even, certain way, yeah, pick plants that are well suited the for that pH. That you have. Yeah, so that's that's a great tip. Then uh, my last thing was really, and this is what f- helped me in that instance was I just use the internet. That's and that's easy for me to say because it's been my first instinct um i'm a millennial so that's yeah. what i do when i have a problem i go to google and type it in and see what other people have as answers for that problem and um like i said that in that example i saw the plants i googled the symptoms said plants that look white and and you can see the veins and and that was the iron deficiency was the first thing that popped up but it mm. happens all the time even when Someone's like, oh, yeah, what year did Kenny Rogers die? <laughs> Which was this year. That I just looked year. that up the other day. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, actually, I knew that one on the top of my head. <laughs> but um, just little things like that, the answers tend to be out there. Uh, and it's easy to, when we were looking at those plants, say, the media is bad. Yeah. It's The media is no good. We can't use it. When it really we were misusing uh, um, the media and not like we didn't have the right pH we were watering too much and that was the the signs and once we looked it up online it was pretty easy to figure out and fix it uh, and it happens a lot a lot yeah. like I said with oh, bone totally. apps too if you want to find out if something's native to your area just google it yeah. and you'll figure out pretty quick and then if you really just, want to dive in to the county level that's when you go on bone app and yeah. and figure it out from there you know like anything else that you're you you do an internet search for just be be wary of the sources make sure you're going to good sources take some things with a grain of salt that kind of kicks me into this and that because that's what i did with my article it was i with the yeah you want to make sure you're choosing your sources accurately and um and vetting them is i guess the biggest part so you want to kick into that yeah all right let's do it so i i think we should probably start off with the who won the last the last one. Yeah, I guess Wait. we have to, all don't right. we? Yeah, all right. So the winner of the last episode's this or that. It's me. Woo! <laughs> so after getting <laughs> blown out, I do want to say the the week before that I got demolished, or the episode before that I got demolished, and I totally chose an article that I thought would pander to to our audience. And it worked, but it was still I, it was still I, fairly close. It was it was yeah. close, and every time we do this, we're getting more votes, which oh, yeah. makes me happy and too. If, if it's close, that means we're both choosing good articles. Yes, too. yeah. So and I think we both chose some good ones this time as well. Yeah, so it was it was close, but I think that um, that they were both good articles. I, yeah. I really do. So, and I think we're getting good feedback. That originally we were we weren't sure how this was being received but Mm -hmm. we've we've gotten a lot of really good feedback on that so and again for all you new listeners when we do this or that this is basically our time where we go and find some current events yeah um sometimes they're not so current like fran's last article (laughs) but but we go look at current events that kind of revolve around that native plant environmental space and uh, and we present them here and then you guys get to go and choose who you thought did the better job of that presentation on our Facebook group. So if you aren't a member of that Facebook group, join the Native Plants Healthy Planet Facebook group, um, and then you get to vote yeah. on uh, on our little 
competition because we had to make this a competition. We, we, we couldn't uh, just it <laughs> we has couldn't to just be. present the news because everything's a competition. <laughs> but we're we're two and two, we're two yep, and two, so up. it's it's pretty close. So I have a feeling this week or this this episode I chose something that interested me. I don't know if it's going to be as appealing to everyone mm-hmm. else, but I I <clears throat> I read this and, one. Well, me too. Mine was mm-hmm. something that. I'm more interested in it. Maybe other people aren't as much, but yeah, so you get to choose who goes first. I'm actually going to go first. Okay. I'm going to go first. So um, the article I chose, it's called The Secrets of the Lost Crops Revealed Were Bison Rome by uh, Talia Oglior of Washington University of St. Louis. So the gist of it, just a paraphrase, um, it was kind of saying early man in North America had had their choice of – Really, all the nuts and berries that you could probably mm. eat. You know, you would think that they were plentiful because there there wasn't as many humans. Um, you know, so why did man that was here before European impact, why did they choose to farm crops? Like who taught – they had to have been taught that. Mm-hmm. Um, and what gave them that inkling to do that? And they were trying to figure that out because – if you were going to do um, small barley, that's a lot of work for a little bit of nutrients when you could pick berries and, and nuts. Mm-hmm. So why would why would someone like take this as an alternative to that? Mm-hmm. Um, so what they did was they started following bison paths through uh, the prairies, the tall prairies, and they were saying even though the bison may not roam there anymore, the the, you can still tell where the paths were. They had been roamed for so long that those paths were changed. And, you know, to early early humans, maybe the tall prairie was a scary place because mm-hmm. it, there were predators, there were snakes, there were potholes, there were a lot of danger to go into those prairies. But where the, the bison roamed, because they were feeding on things like barley and, you know, uh, the seeds were being dispersed through their droppings, through the roaming a lot of the paths were filled with crops Mm -hmm. you know small barley was was evident in the paths that the bison were taking and what they were eating and that was where humans felt safe Mm -hmm. (laughs) and that was what dictated some of their diet so they they were crediting the bison for basically teaching (laughs) crops to early humans that's pretty interesting yeah yeah, it's a, it's a it's a pretty neat study. If you get a chance, we'll we'll post it on the website. But take a look at it. Mm-hmm. I felt I found that interesting for yeah. me. Um, so hopefully someone else will will find it as interesting. Yeah. So what did the, like about what time period did they say this happened? They didn't say. They didn't say, or at least I don't remember. Mm-hmm. I'd have to go through and look. I okay. I don't remember. But I think some of the some of it. The studies maybe were being done, or some of the tips were from the Tall Grass Prairie Preserve. Um, so yeah. uh, about some of the things, what to look for. Very so. cool. And yeah. did they say what like species of bison it was? Because I learned from if you go back to our books episode, uh, yes. one of my favorite nature books was called The American Buffalo, where I learned that there were thousands of, or not thousands, but there are tons of different prehistoric buffalo. I am doing a or, quick, and the one we know today is bison, bison, bison is the taxonomical name yeah i'm looking through to see if they clarify real fast um so they're they're saying six thousand years ago wow um as early as six thousand years ago um they're they're figuring it started but they're not really going into which classification Mm -hmm. so it's still pretty cool yeah. So I had a, a variety of articles to choose from this week, and uh, I didn't do the one about um, – because it's, it's been popular on a bunch of other podcasts I listen to about uh, the damselfish that are, like, using shrimp to, to cultivate yeah. algae. Yes. <laughs> I didn't get into that one. There was another really cool article I found on uh, on hemlocks that I also I s- didn't I get s- into. I saw that one. Um, because I wanted to be a little edgier, I guess, and uh-huh. – um, but the article I ended up using was uh, was <laughs> talk about a a unstamped, <laughs> unsubstantiated resource was from a, a website called theinstigator.com, <laughs> which, <laughs> which I did vet and and I'll put a disclaimer on it. I went and looked up 
the author and looked up a little bit more about him. Yeah. Uh, frankly, because I found him on LinkedIn uh, on a oh. different article, and okay. it was uh, the the post on LinkedIn was all of, all about uh, Jeff Bezos. Oh, yes. And yeah. I've seen it a lot recently. Uh, it's if you're on Facebook, if you're on a lot of these social medias, you've probably seen how Jeff Bezos, owner of uh, or CEO of Amazon, his net worth has skyrocketed through the pandemic and so have a lot of these other billionaires that are out there and uh and his linkedin post was kind of ripping him saying oh he could be giving more to his employees he could be doing this he could be doing this and um and and i when i always look at him uh, at those kind of posts i always think well i net worth doesn't necessarily mean liquid cash it doesn't mean yeah. if he's if he had a billion dollars and went up 67 percent that doesn't mean he has $670 million more that he can spend. It just means that the assets he own are worth more. Um, but it doesn't mean it could be gone tomorrow. Yeah. It could devalue overnight through the stock market. Um, but I guess just the, the cynic in me, I always like to read the comments on these kind of things. <laughs> and the first comment was by a guy uh, named Mark uh, Tersek. And he said, I just wrote an article about what Jeff Bezos is doing with his Bezos Earth Fund. And uh, so I clicked on that, and that's the article I did today. It is titled, I Come to Praise Bezos, Not Bury Him. And um, the article basically outlines how, and I'll start, he actually had a disclaimer, which made me look him up a little bit more, saying how he used to be the CEO of the Niche Conservancy, which we had yes. their New Jersey branch come yes. on the podcast a little bit earlier. Um, so he admitted he had some personal bias in this. Okay. Um, and uh, basically this article or opinion piece stated that Jeff Bezos laid out the Earth Fund, that he has dedicated $10 billion. And I don't know if there's a set like time limit on that that he wants to get, but $10 billion is still $10 billion mm -hmm. um, towards giving back to climate change or finding, doing research into climate change. Um, no one else has done this before. Yeah. Even a lot of governments around the world haven't dedicated this kind of money to this kind of yeah. thing so that's a private citizen and is that is doing this is really just revolutionary yeah. um and then uh, he announced that the, the earth fund back in february and then uh the human fund the, the human fund is that what i said <laughs> no no that's that's seinfeld <laughs> <No>. <laughs> sorry but um so he announced it back in February, and then nothing really came out about it. Yeah. Up until November, he started to announce the first wave of organizations that were going to be getting money. And I think it was organizations like the Nature Conservancy, the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, there's a whole list, and they were getting, some of them, up to like $100, bill or $100 million wow. towards their missions. And people took Twitter and, and Facebook and just started to rip him, Jeff Bezos apart, saying, you had the op opportunity to do something revolutionary and do all this really cool stuff. And um, and the author of this article took offense to that and said, you're kind of discrediting a lot of these NGOs. Yeah. And Jeff Bezos built this company out of his garage into Amazon, making really smart decisions and empowering the right people to, to take off with, with the ideas. Yeah. And he's like, a lot of these NGOs are, even though the Nature Conservancy is a huge organization, as far as NGOs go, yeah. it's really not that big when you compare it to companies like Walmart and Amazon and Google, yeah. who have sometimes millions of employees. The Nature Conservancy has 4,000. So really it's not that big, even though it has global reach. It's, and yes. yeah. So it's undermanned. It's underfunded because they have more projects than they have money for, and uh, and often have to turn things down. And now they got a hundred million dollars to put towards that stuff. And I think there was even one instance where another person was criticizing how, oh, we want to see something really cool that's never been done before. And one of the organizations was using that hundred million dollars to launch a satellite to study climate change yeah. and how different things worked and all that. So it was kind of accomplishing that goal still. Uh, and basically, the article says a lot of people are just ripping ripping Jeff Bezos because they don't like Amazon, they don't like Jeff yeah. Bezos. Yeah. And um, but what he's doing is still really good because he's taking that money and putting it in organizations that already are doing good work. They have the manpower, they have the infrastructure. The things that they're are short on a lot of times is money. Yeah. And um, and so instead of him creating 
this brand new thing. He's just putting the money into places where they're already doing it. And uh, so, and, and, and got it, some negative feedback, but in in <clears throat> this and like I said, I vetted this yeah. this source a little bit and found out. Well, Mark or yeah, it was Mark Tersek. He was uh, an investment banker for Goldman Sachs, who then was uh, the head of their environmental division before he started with the Nature Conservancy. So yeah, obviously his biases, his job with the Nature Conservancy was to yeah. create bonds with a lot of these big corporations and get them to donate money to them. And I'm inclined to but, agree. You know, here's one of the things, and you you've witnessed this firsthand. When all of a sudden there's money that that can be spent, it's amazing the ideas that get thrown out yeah. because people oh, have yeah. these ideas and and you're holding on to them, knowing that they're just not right or you're dreaming big, but you're just not there. And we just had this instant last week where it was like, yeah. oh, you, <laughs> you know, like throw out some ideas. You know, these these NGOs are no different. There's a lot of great work they can do, and they have a lot of great ideas. They just don't have the funding to accomplish them. So empowering them to do the people that whose job it is to think big and do this good work giving them the money and the power to do that Mm -hmm. is can be pretty phenomenal yeah and it's um i forget where that thought was going but it's it's one of the things i've just noticed on my personal facebook timelines a lot is uh there's a lot of hate for a lot of these big organizations and that's one of the reasons we want to have cw cwrp the corporate wetlands restoration partnership come on because a lot of people don't know that some of these corporations are giving back, exactly, and uh, and just assume that they're uh, run by robots that are <laughs> that doing nothing care. but acquiring. They don't care. That's, you know, and I, hmm. I'm not saying that there aren't cases where that's true, yeah. but there's plenty of cases where it's not. So you, you have to remember that you yeah. can't lump everyone into one category. And like in Amazon's case, it's a it's a business that literally has changed the way that we live yeah. for i think for the better overall yeah. we're saying there's not too many businesses that have done that yeah. like google is yeah i think one we can all name yeah. it. it was google yeah. amazon microsoft yeah apple the, those are the businesses that have changed i'm sure a lot of there's some business behind live. the scenes too but yeah. that are out front and changing the way that we do things changing the way business functions um and making things more convenient in our day-to-day lives yeah um but there's a lot of uh, negative feedback about them too, and there always will be. Yeah, even we. And have I think a, a lot of it is is deserved. Yeah. Even but, we uh, have a one star review. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I haven't forgotten. <laughs> All right. So but with, with that, guys, go on to the Facebook group and and make sure you vote. Uh, only for me. Don't vote for. You friends. have to vote because there can be only one. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, you know what? Both great stories. I, I think both are admirable of, mm-hmm. of winning. Of course, I would love to win because I, you got to take them when you can get them. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Every 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 time I get bombarded, like I lose really bad, I'm like, I may never win again. <laughs> so, But, yeah, make sure make sure you go vote, and then uh, on the next buzz, we'll yeah. announce it. And leave your feedback. Let, yeah. let us know what you think about the, the Bezos Earth Fund or what you think about the bison and barley and – yeah. Whatever the heck Fran was thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll end it there. And of course, the choice is yours. All right, so so we actually got questions this week. We did, yeah. I want to ask you a bunch of questions. And I want to have them answered immediately. It's a simple question. Um, no, I didn't hear you. What was your question? And none of them were named Saul. That's surprising. That I could have sworn I saw his number <laughs> pop up on the caller ID. No, <laughs> no. It, we we had – not only did we get questions, I find it amazing that we got questions from two independent people. From different parts of the, the country. The country. Well, same part of the – similar parts of the country. Same, similar region. But from New not England, the same state. Both from New England with similar topics that lead into each other. Like you couldn't ask for – a better question to lead yeah. into another question. I think question. our second caller is going to be upset that you said where she's from is New England. I don't. I don't think Southern New York is. Part I thought of New she England. said upstate New York. Did she I, say Southern New York? Yeah, she said Southern New York. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to play them, so maybe I'm wrong. All we'll, right. we'll have to hear. All right, for anyone that gets upset, rewind back about thirty minutes for my little rant <laughs> yeah. where I said <laughs> I'm going to say things that are wrong and that I'm not perfect. There, so. I don't know. Isn't New York part of New England? 
I don't I don't consider it part of New England. I think I, honestly, I think a lot of it's especially when you get in upstate New York, a okay. lot of it's split. Some people consider them New England's. A lot of people don't. I'm about to get some wrath, yeah. aren't I? You might. All right, you know, for, <laughs> I, I'm going to play the first. Yeah, let's, 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 let's play. Let's, let's, <laughs> Hi, Fran and Tom. This is Alyssa from Connecticut. Um, these are some of the things I've been thinking about and would love your input. Even though it's only winter, I'm thinking ahead to the coming seasons of yard work. In the fall, it's recommended that we all rake up our leaves and bring them to the curb to be hauled away. But doesn't leaf litter provide habitat for creatures to overwinter in? And isn't it good for the soil when it breaks down? And if so, where does the idea of getting rid of beneficial yard litter come from? How important is it overall for supporting wildlife? Also, are there any other common seasonal lawn care practices which we should be aware of and maybe think differently about when it comes to ecological gardening, especially with regard to providing habitat, which we know from your podcast is super important. Thanks guys. Have a great week. That is a great question. You couldn't really ask for a better question. So, um, you know, the funny thing is some things that you take for granted. We all have been taught to rake your leaves. Mm-hmm. I had no idea where it come from. I don't know that it's necessarily even known because the first rakes date back to 1100 BC. Um, you know, it, it was mainly for gathering grain. I think the modern rake was invented in 1874 by Edmund Brown. So raking has existed for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I, I think, I think early reasoning was that you're taught that leaves suffocate your lawn. You're going to get dead patches. You really want to rake it up to let your your lawn mm-hmm. breathe. Um, I don't think people really knew the benefits of, yeah. oh, of yeah. what leaves provided. Mm-hmm. They just – It's it's fairly new yeah. science that yeah. we're seeing the, the life and um, the ecosystem that really – needs those leaves to survive and without the leaves then then you don't have it no one considered dead leaves habitat but mm-hmm. it's habitat oh, it, yeah. it really is you know there are signs if you look back i think um the farmer's almanac going back to 1944 stated you know leaves make great compost like back then that was but still it's not habitat it's mm-hmm. saying you know there's there's value there's to nutrients it. in it to give back to your gardener yeah. or those kind of things yeah so I, I mean i think a lot of this is newer science um and and uh Alyssa, uh made some good points leaf dunk, uh decomposition improves soil health because mm-hmm. there are nutrients you let it break down enter the soil it, it kind of gives back uh, to the soil, mm-hmm. almost, yeah. uh, almost oh, yeah. like a, a cover crop. Mm-hmm. Um, it makes great mulch. I think we've talked about that on mm-hmm. on episodes before. That you can use leaves as mulch in your garden. It's mm-hmm. a great way to, to help over winter. Um, but it is a habitat. It does support uh, beneficial insects, life cycles of butterflies, squirrels, turtles, earthworms, salamanders, uh, chipmunks, uh, all things that mm-hmm. kind of depend on this. And insects lay their, their eggs in the leaves. So it's it has so much beneficial value. And we're saying to have less lawn anyway. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like we're, we're, we're already saying that the lawn is basically a uh, barren as mm-hmm. far as uh, what it provides. Yeah, there's uh, – Doug Talmy lays it out perfectly in in his works that lawns really provide no ecological value to almost any uh, living thing yeah um and it's a non-native grass so yeah so it's you know you're you're actually doing doing the the food web a system by Mm -hmm. by leaving by leaving leaves yeah so um but then uh, Alyssa also wanted to know lawn habits that we may want to think about. And I really thought hard about that. I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. what are some things that we're doing that that we really shouldn't be doing? Um, and uh, first one that we talk about all the time is chemicals. And I think a lot of people – like we all have that one neighbor that probably spends so much on chemicals. They don't want any uh, dandelions in their mm-hmm. uh, lawn or crabgrass and, and all that all those chemicals have to go somewhere, and they're they're hurting something. Mm-hmm. So, if you can abandon chemical use, I think that's a great one. Yeah, yep. Um, we talked a little bit about cutting back gardens in the spring. Yeah, 
yeah. uh, and the and some of the benefits of it. Um, but then leaving the seed heads on after your flowers have mm-hmm. bloomed, just yeah. leaving the seed heads on. I know with our uh, our Menarda that I've talked about before, yeah. uh, we had tons of goldfinches just coming right up to the front porch and sitting on the Menarda and echinacea stems and just yeah. picking the seed heads off because I don't trim anything back in the fall until later in the year. And that was actually another part was to keep some of those stalks. Like I mentioned earlier, yeah. I only trim it back to maybe a foot, foot and a half tall. Yeah. Um, so it looks kempt, somewhat kempt, yeah. I guess. But um, a lot of insects will use those those stems as uh, overwintering, especially yeah. bees will actually use the stems as uh, a place to overwinter. Overwinter, so. or it could be uh, uh, a place for uh, shelter yeah. uh, or a safe haven. Um, you know, we all know dead wood uh, has an ecological function. Mm-hmm. You know, there's insects that, that live off of dead wood, things like that. So leave some of the dead wood around instead of picking up all the branches. Mm-hmm. Uh, leave some. Le- leave some for for that food web yeah and a couple of the other seasonal things that she mentioned uh that i thought about is the the use of mulch in the spring how we have to mulch and have those those spaces in between each plant is its own little thing and it's got yeah like just the mountains of mulch around it um claudia west points out perfectly you can just use plants as mulch yeah um if you really want something in between the plants you need that dead space in between you can use Use leaves like we just talked about pine straw those kind of things you don't need to to get processed uh wood chips to to have mulch in between plants um or you can use low growing native if if you have the right habitat like carex pennsylvanica is one that (laughs) and uh there's another carex that's really carex appalachia Appalachia. and there's one more that starts with an e the second name I, I, I'm drawing a blank but the um, you know you could use things like uh, Kinnikinnik which is Arctostophilos mm-hmm. which you have to have the right habitat for that that's yep. not just going yep. to live anywhere or, or wintergreen uh, mm-hmm. things like that that are native that stay low you know find you know find the right places for it yeah, yeah. Um, uh, one other thing I put in there yeah. was uh, Kelly another thing Kelly Gill pointed out in one of her presentations, I think I saw the Ecological Landscape Alliance meeting in Delaware last year, and um, she was talking about how much more well received a lot of these native gardens were. You just put a border around it, yeah. And in her case, she used a lot of like dead logs, um, which is great as the border, and just made it so there was an edge. There was an edge, and in that case the dead logs can actually be habitat for a lot of other things as well but it gave that edge and it just made it look a little cleaner and people were a lot more accepting of it so yeah the the one thing to keep in mind too even for woodies um some things die back from from the tips of the stem so by Mm -hmm. leaving it for the spring too you're ensuring that those plants don't get detrimental damage Mm -hmm. like uh native roses um if you're trying to keep them uh, like swamp rose or, or Carolina rose, you really want to do that trim back in March uh, mm-hmm. because if you trim it back in the fall, you're going to get dyed back from the tips. And there's a good chance you could mm-hmm. lose that plant. That's really a spring uh, cleanup rather than a fall cleanup. So you're mm-hmm. doing a lot of good by those things. So, um, But that was a great question. But the next question kind of – is a continuation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I don't it def- know it's definitely a continuation. It's on the yeah. similar path at yeah. the very least. So, so let's play that one. Hi, my name is Jennifer. I'm calling from southern New York. Um, and I have a question about leaf litter, which obviously is a little bit late for this year, um, but I'm still going to have the same question next year. Um, so my question is that I know that it is good to leave leaf litter um, to provide overwintering habitat for for bugs, um, but I'm wondering if it matters whether the leaves are coming from native versus non-native plants. Um, so, yeah, I would like to know that. Thank you. Bye. That is a great question, and that's a very difficult and tricky question. I, I think it's very comp. There's, I don't have a an answer. Oh, me neither. Uh, well, uh, we we have a lot to discuss. <laughs> yeah. But we don't have an answer. You mm-hmm. know, the one, the first thing I thought of, if you have an area that's mainly uh, invaded by invasives, mm-hmm. the invasion species, yeah. <laughs> um, you're probably already lacking the diversity in micro invertebrate, mm-hmm. uh, micro invertebrates. 
already just because or macro invertebrates sorry um because you're not they're not being supported already um mm -hmm. so that that kind of system's already broken um but are leaves just leaves when they're on the ground are they if they're providing habitat are they being supported yeah i would think that they have different nutrient loads and just uh we kind of mentioned it with the the or alluded to it with the ph thing i mentioned yeah. way earlier in the podcast but different plants have different requirements the ph will dictate what micronutrients are available to plants and if a plant needs a different ph i would assume that it has different micronutrients available in the leaf litter that then drops and is yeah. decomposes the soil yeah so it's you know there is a ton of studies that have been done in so many sp different areas <laughs> that it, it kind of you know the findings of this and the findings of that kind of make it inconclusive based on the scenario mm -hmm. um one of the ones that I was drawn to was a study from ESA journals online on riparian buffer systems in Western uh, Canada. Um, and they brought in invasive leaves. They did a test study um, for it, but they tried to match it up to take an invasive that would provide the same function as a native. So mm -hmm. they tried to match up like this would be a good substitute for this if you had to pick an exotic. and. And they brought the leaves in, and they they mixed to see what would happen. So, it's a very lengthy, <laughs> very lengthy study in journal. But what they found was that some of the exotic leaves sometimes uh, decomposed at a faster rate. So maybe mm -hmm. they weren't there long enough to provide the the same amount of uh, function. Um, and you have to remember they have the different chemical makeup mm -hmm. and and provide different nutrient content. So it it really depended. Um, they were saying in some cases, some of these studies say macro, macro invertebrates didn't care if it was exotic or native. Mm -hmm. It was there. In some cases, it broke down faster. In some cases, it didn't break down faster. In some cases, the nutrient content made a difference. In some, it, it, diff, it didn't. What I'm getting from this is that it's – even if it's invasive leaves, it – it provides a benefit than mm -hmm. leaving no leaf litter at all. Having yeah. that leaf litter there is better than nothing. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's true. And uh, the other big thing I take away is that we have people that are asking the right questions and the science is underway. Yes. That's one of the things that's really cool, especially when it comes to native plants and a lot of the environmental sciences, is that it's brand, brand new, especially when you consider uh, – the, the timeline of human existence yeah we're just barely scratching the surface so it's stuff that's being done right now you guys are at the forefront of this whole, whole yeah thing. the science is new but there's a lot of science there were a ton of studies to choose from mm -hmm. to talk about this they still don't know yeah it, you know there's still a lot of science that has to happen mm -hmm. um but i guess we'll know i you know that the important thing is if, if that's what you have use it slowly transition you know yeah. as you take away those invasives and you're going to have the natives they're going to to provide mm -hmm. hopefully a better function we don't really know because invasives are so ingrained in in so many landscapes i can you go to any natural place near us and not find invasives i think it would be very hard not to find yeah uh, find something that had unless it's a place like duke farms and it was a particular part where they'd been through and cultivated it to pull out all the invasives and then did took measures to keep them out I, yeah that's I, the only kind of thing i could think which and then is it a, a wild or, or natural place anymore when you're putting that much work into yeah, it? yeah like do we know how it's supposed to function mm -hmm. if how everything's supposed to function naturally anyway because mm -hmm. i i don't know mm -hmm. i'm sure it's hard to find those those purely pristine natural areas so. yeah yep and so i hope I don't know that those are the best answers, but I hope that helps mm -hmm. uh, answer some of these questions, and it may even provoke more questions. So please uh, make sure – we love these questions. We, Tom oh, and I yeah. were really excited because this is, like I said, more in-depth than we could have answered them online. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. And we're, yeah. We're able to do a little research. We were able to discuss it in, at greater length. Um, so please call. Yeah, and I know some of the people that called were hesitant to call because mm -hmm. uh, not everyone wants to hear their voice, but we appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, and frankly, I was just glad we didn't have to hear from Saul again. 
<laughs> you, I'm sure he'll call back at some point. You know it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. You know it's going to happen. It's, it's. I, I'm but if sure. But he was going to be the only one calling, we were going to have to cut off this segment from the show. Um, we, were, we couldn't put up with it that much longer. No, because it would just be the Saul show at yeah. that point, and that's not what this is about. So I'm, I'm just taking a look at time. We're already well over an hour. We're about an hour and say somewhere between 10 minutes and 15 yeah, minutes. Do you want to th- do a pod deck? I think we still do it. It's All become right. our, our closer now. All right. So let's see what we got here. Uh, pick something from the middle here. Ah, we can't do that. <laughs> it says record coffee with a friend and colleague. So we're having water. Yeah, we kind of just yeah. did that. <laughs> that's, we yeah, we kind of just did, did that. Um, let me see. <laughs> Was that like pouring the coffee out of the pot? And then that's what they want us to record. <laughs> All right, I'm I'm going to take the obscenity out of this, but uh, cool stuff I'm using lately. So it says it could be apps, products, or services. Oh man, I gotta think. So I'll I'll start off. I I bought myself. I shared with everyone. I I bought myself the rare Christmas present. Now I don't know how how um, oh, geez, you know, for for this product, is this it's it's probably not necessarily PETA friendly. You mm-hmm. would say so. I don't know how everyone anyone or everyone is going to feel about this, but I treated myself to a pair of UGG slippers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's like it's like walking on clouds. It's like my feet. I'm I'm literally at, at a two at least two points during this podcast. I was thinking about going home and putting on those slippers. <laughs> <laughs> I've always been intrigued by the whole UGG line, especially when they started the UGG for men. I just never pulled the trigger. So my my oldest son Darian wanted a pair of UGG boots for Christmas. Mm-hmm. His his girlfriend wear wears UGGs, and he was completely intrigued, and he bought a pair. And um, Agatha has a couple pairs of slippers. She doesn't have boots, but she has a couple pairs of slippers, mm-hmm. and always has them on. And I've just become so jealous watching everyone. Everyone wear around these you get, get that. The UGG. I was like, well, <laughs> I want a pair too, and. You know, and they're pricey. They're not cheap, mm-hmm. and uh, it's it's probably the most com- comfortable thing I've ever worn. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that is considered cool. In so in, some sure cir- in some circles, <laughs> it is. <laughs> Maybe not this one, but <laughs> you know, I I don't know that everyone is going to to be as thrilled with my admission to that. But um, I don't think. Yeah, it's a good one following Christmas. Yeah, I I just don't know how the process of how those are made um, mm-hmm. it, that they're necessarily – I don't know that they're animal friendly. I don't know. I don't know the yeah. background. I probably should yeah. have researched that maybe before I <laughs> <laughs> before I bought but them or brought it for, up. Uh, for me, it's uh, – I mentioned in the beginning of this episode how I, I – one of the reasons I like hunting is because of the nature aspect, yeah. the history aspect, and then the cooking aspect, which for Christmas um, – I've been saying the name of this wrong uh, oh, over okay. and over again, but my wife got me a – I'm gonna I'm gonna think about it and nail it. A, a bicicleta. I I hope that's right. Oh. You can't correct me. If no, I, I don't even says, know what no, it is. It's pronounced this way. <laughs> anyway, it's a pasta cutter. It's got like a bunch of different cutters on it, um, and it, they look like bike wheels. I think it's named after bicycles. Oh, okay. Um, Which is bicicleta? Yeah, bicicleta? something like that. Okay. And uh, then you can space it out for if you want fettuccine or. Oh. Or, or parpatelli and then you space it out so now you're making multiple cuts at once instead of and i actually used it the other day when i made a little pasta uh, uh cacio e pepe oh, for nice. our side for our duck breast we so we, we like pasta here yeah too. <laughs> just saying i'm just saying so that's one of the cool things from a um a uh a plant side of things i guess i've been using um i use two apps a lot well three I have one for the weather, but I'm looking it up in multiple places. It's actually called I don't think I don't think a lot of people would actually like this because it's a little difficult to use. But it's called Field View, Climate Field View. Okay. And it, I have like our nursery in New York. I have all our different properties around here oh, awesome. on there, and it'll tell me what the rainfall and accumulation was. I get an email every morning saying every time it rained, I get an email there. Um, I also use a, another app called On Onyx Maps a lot. Um, and it basically gives you like property delineations 
Okay. And um, that one's actually very interesting because uh, from a hunting perspective, I will use it to see, well, who owns this? Like, where, where's the actual property boundary? Um, but we also use it for, Steve and I were using it for seed collection. Steve, my brother, oh, does our- a lot of our seed propagation. And we're saying, oh, well, who owns this piece of property? Because they have a really nice stand of Andropogon virginicus, and we might want to go get it. <laughs> so we got to figure out who it is. So I use it from a work capacity that way now, and combine that with uh, iNaturalist. Um, I've talked about iNaturalist before as an identification app. One of the things I really love it for is I'll look up where other people have – say I, um, uh, I really wanted to find uh, Muhlenbergia capillaris, which mm-hmm. is pink muley grass. Yeah. I want to find a native stand of it. So I'll go on there and search it. I shouldn't be giving away this secret. This is a real insider <laughs> tip. <laughs> so I want to find a native stand of it, and I'll go on there, see where people have tagged it, and then I'll kind of cross-reference with that Onyx Maps and see where who owns the properties and is it someplace we're allowed to go? Would it be Where can we get permission to go collect stuff? You know, the one thing yeah. I appreciate about iNaturalist, and I almost mentioned it earlier, and – the one thing for our listeners to remember about, especially Tom and I, you get a little jaded with your plant ID because you're used to seeing it on the nursery at a certain size. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So all of a sudden, if you're used to seeing something two to three foot tall and then you're in nature and you see something 60 foot tall, off the top of your head, you're IDing it differently <laughs> than than you are. Maybe you know an oak at a seedling mm-hmm. is – exhibiting different leaves than an oak as a mature oak. Yeah. So um, there, there's different things you have to look at. So sometimes, yeah, I get stumped all the time. I don't know everything. You're out in nature, and you're like, what What the heck is this? I love the feedback of iNaturalist because sometimes even by the picture, you have choices, and you're not quite mm-hmm. sure. And I like the, getting the feedback when you make it public of people saying, yes, it's definitely that or it might be this. I, I appreciate I that. I would think, Fran, you would not like that aspect of it. I actually, as they're, now they're telling you that you were wrong. I like when they agree with me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's, I, you know, when they don't agree with me, I just delete yeah. it. But, Fran, when you first brought that pod deck out like a couple episodes ago when yeah. we did it, I was a little hesitant, but I've come to like, it really makes us think and and break out of what we were going to talk about. No, I, I totally cool. like that it's coming up with ideas that I don't know that you and I would come up oh, with yeah, uh, organically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe if we sat down and thought about it, I mm-hmm. like the idea of not knowing what's coming up. Because, yes, yeah. you know, obviously we know we have questions that we've prepared for. We know what our topic is we're going to talk about. I like that there's this one aspect that I just have no idea. Yeah. And it no, makes you think quick. A little curveball. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. totally. And I like those... The weather app that I use, I, I like hearing about the apps you're using, mm-hmm. is one called Carrot, mm-hmm. and I think it's done by Dark Sky. So Dark Sky is one of those apps that will give you the app uh, or give you the notification like it's going to rain in your area in one minute. Mm-hmm. You know, like yeah. you know when it's going to rain. But the gist behind Carrot is it's a machine that dislikes humans. Yeah. <laughs> And you can, you and can, I know the things you've shared with me have been somewhat condescending. Oh yeah, and you can you can select the volatile, uh, how volatile you want them to act towards you. So like I have it ramped up, mm-hmm. but yeah. you can make it, you know, a, a little uh, nicer yeah. to you. But I, I like, I'm I'm a weather app snob. When it, yeah. I have like four that I use, <laughs> and it's like all for different things that I'm using them for. But that um, that one in particular is so that I can. I didn't realize how much, well, growing up where we are, you see how different the weather can be just only a mile away. And our farms really are fairly close, but one's a mile down the road, one's a couple miles away. Um, and we've noticed, well, it'll be raining at our headquarters where we're sitting right now, mm-hmm. but and we might get an inch of rain here, but just a mile away, we'll only get half an inch or a quarter inch sometimes. And um, so that just, that app the climate field view just kind of gives me a nice organized report so we can say okay it poured here i'm waking up thinking everything's wet but over there it's really not as wet as it is when you're trying to keep plants alive that part gets pretty yeah important. no that's so, pretty awesome yeah. that's great you know it it's amazing 
when you think of something that you could use in your life and someone's already developed it. Yes. <laughs> and that's why you go to Google first when you, when you think of something to see if it's already out there. Or you see it and you didn't realize <laughs> you need that in your life. Yeah. You're like, oh, like there's a certain, you know, and there's certain things that seem so simple. Um, one of the apps that I use, you know what? I should have brought this up. What is the name of this app? I use it every day and I don't know the name of it. Um, It is called Lazy Bones. So <laughs> all it you is the, the best named apps. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's Lazy Bones and the gist of it is you know, it was one of the ones it, it gets a lot of uh promotion because it's widget based. Mm -hmm. You like when iPhones went with uh homepage widgets, it was one of the ones that did it. So all it is is reminders. But they're all positive reminders. Mm -hmm. Like you can set reminders on your phone for anything yeah, and have yeah. the reminder widget show you. But it will be like take a vitamin uh, every morning, uh, drink a couple glasses of water, uh, meditate, do mm -hmm. this. It's like positive things yeah. Yeah. that just kindly reminds you. And it's because everything's a competition. You, you see how many days in a row you can complete your tasks. Mm, yeah. Like it makes it streaks. Yeah. It keeps – uh, progress of all your daily challenges. Yeah. So, yeah, so. You, your weather app beats you down to a state of depression, and then you have this <laughs> and other lazy app bones kind of lifts you back, you back up. up. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of, <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. So. It's all about balance. Didn't so, we just talk about that <laughs> yeah. in the, la the last episode? So, with that, we're gonna wrap it up. That is it. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed listening to the Buzz edition of Native Plants Healthy Planet presented by Pylons Nursery. I would love to give a big thank you to RJ Comer for our new Buzz theme music. Uh, make sure you stream or buy RJ's music on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you consume your music. Uh, let's see. You can follow us on Twitter at Pineland Nursery, Facebook at Pinelands Nursery NJ, Instagram at Pinelands Nursery, and YouTube at Pinelands Nursery. Uh, it's interesting to see how many people consume our podcast on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, that you know, has been interesting. There's no video, although we're hoping – that's one thing we're doing after this. We're seeing if we can figure, yeah. configure when we do these roundtables if you – Yeah, that's if, our New Year's resolution. Yes, <laughs> yes. To, to try and get a video up there so you can see our beautiful faces as we, we – stumble through another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see us not paying attention yeah. at certain points uh let's see um don't forget we have the question and answer line thank you to our two callers jennifer and Alyssa, for calling in with your wonderful questions neither from new england ne <laughs> <laughs> excuse me one of them was oh, from new england uh, <laughs> one of them was from connecticut that is new england i meant to chime in earlier Southern New York, not. I me. know. I listened. I was hoping she was going to say Northern New York, but it wasn't. So uh, you can call us if you would like to uh, ask a question or leave a comment. You can call us at 215 346 6189. I'll repeat that one more time if you're writing it down 215 346 6189. Ask us a question, leave a comment. If we pick your question or comment, we'll play it on a future episode of The Buzz and we will answer it for you. And uh, keep it going, everyone, on the Native Plants Healthy Planet Facebook group. We have a lot of new people. Uh, it was it was really interesting to see where everyone was uh, listening from or how they found us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a really diverse group, so take advantage of that when you yeah. have questions. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, and it grew uh, a lot just in between the last episode and now. Oh, totally. So, uh, thank you for joining that. Make sure you vote uh, on uh, this or that, and keep it going. You can listen to Native Plants Healthy Planet directly at www.nativeplantshealthyplanet.com. You can also check us out on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, Stitcher, really wherever you consume your podcasts. Uh, make sure when you're there to subscribe, leave a review, and really, if you want to help us out the most, just share this with a friend. Yeah. Um, you're not just helping us, you're helping the whole planet. So uh, We love doing this, and we want to be able to keep doing it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. This is this is a big thing. So the more you share it, the bigger they get. The more more we get to do this, and the more creative we get to get with it. Yeah, too. exactly, so. exactly. So uh, one last thing, you can even ask Alexa to play the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast. I might have even done that just now if you're listening at home. <laughs> so, so happy New Year, everyone. We are really excited about what we have in store for you. Uh, we hope you are too. And with that, I want to thank everyone again. I'm Tom, and I am Fran. Thank you so much, everyone. We appreciate everyone that takes time out of their busy schedule to listen we will see you again on the next episode until then keep it native
Thank you for listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planted Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Remember to like, share, follow, and comment.